streaming, what streaming? For the last four weeks, five weeks, I have been playing nothing but CDs in my lounge listening room here using a PS Audio Direct Stream memory player, which just has a digital output. And I've been feeding that into a DAC, which we'll come to in a moment. But I want to start today talking about cameras. So this is my Canon EOS R. And I use a range of lenses for my photographs and then more recently for slider shots in these videos. But we use different kinds of lenses for different kinds of shots. Well, Olaf does because he knows more than me. With this camera with stills, on here right now I've got a Canon lens. It's a 50 mil and if I take a photograph of Olaf now. Now what I like about this lens is that the tonality of the photos is a little bit warm, but also a little bit soft. So it's not really kind of pinpoint accurate with details. It's just a little bit fuzzy at the edges. And I like that. But if we take this lens off, if I connect a Sigma lens, now this is a 35 mil, so this is obviously a wider lens. Now what I like about this lens is that the tonality is different to the Canon in that it's, it leans a little bit towards the cooler side, just a little bit, just a tinge. And the other difference is it is pinpoint sharp. It is super detailed. Everything is very crisply defined, more so than the Canon. I would say that the Canon, the way it presents a photo looks more like evening light or late afternoon light. Whereas the Sigma gives me the impression of a sort of cooler, not stronger, but crisper morning light. Now, if I have to ask myself which one of these lenses is the most accurate, I can probably do that because I'm here right now looking at Olaf behind the camera. I've taken two photographs and I can look at each one and go, well, that one's close or, or is it that one? And try and make some kind of assessment. But when it comes to audio, to sound, to music, we can't do that because we were never at the original event. So if we're trying to compare two DACs, DAC A and DAC B, and asking ourselves which one is the most accurate, which one is closer to the original event, we have no earthly idea because we weren't in the studio with the band, we weren't in, even in the control room with the engineer who's listening through different kinds of speakers, different hardware setup, and then most music is sort of pieced together in software. So again, how does that help us determine accuracy? It doesn't. But I think when people are talking about accuracy, what they're actually driving at is a feeling, a sense of accuracy, a sense of being closer to the original event. And with these two lenses, with the Sigma and the Canon, I would say the Sigma is probably closer to the original event in most situations. At the end of November, I bought a new DAC, the RME ADI 2 FS. Now the FS version refers to, I think, the femto clock timing inside this DAC. It's got an AKM, I'm looking at my notes here, 4493 DAC chip, and it comes with a remote control, and it's made right here in Germany. Now this DAC comes with a very hefty manual. It's in English and in German, but it's just, it's insane. This manual is both a dream and a nightmare because it's exceptionally detailed. It gives you a strong background on what the engineers have tried to do with this DAC. It also in includes a suite of measurements. That's upside down, but, so I don't know why anybody would ever measure this DAC because you've got them here, unless you don't believe the manufacturer, of course. But this manual, I think, we're gonna measure it in a moment, is heavier than the DAC itself. So the DAC weighs 912.6 grams. And then the manual, 
330.4 grams. So I lied and it is nowhere near the same weight as the DAC. So obviously my ability to assess the weight of products with my hands is somewhat questionable. Anyway, this is the DAC. You can see it has a 6.4, I call it 6.4 millimeter headphone socket. Some people call it 6.3. Three and a half mil headphone socket. This is just designed for IEMs. It's meant to be low noise. And then on the back, we have RCA outputs and balanced outputs. So really this is like one output, that's a second, that's a third. And with this unit's internal DSP, we can apply, if we want to, a five band parametric EQ to each of these outputs individually, separately. So they can all have different settings, which is why the manual is so big, because you can do so many things to each of the individual outputs on this unit which is pretty cool. Now we'll get to headphone listening in a bit, but I did the bulk of my listening to this as a DAC, completely flat, so no parametric EQ applied, and with a loudspeaker system. So with the KEF LS50 Meta, powered by a MyTech Brooklyn amp. The preamp was the PS Audio BHK. Then before that, this as a DAC, and then as we know from my recent weeks with CDs, fed by the PS Audio Direct Stream Player. Oh, almost forgot, three digital inputs. So we've got USB, coax, Tarslink. I mainly used, well actually exclusively used the coax with my CD transport. Kraftwerk live box set from four years ago. I've only just bought this a couple of weeks ago. It was a pain to find and very expensive now. I've got the vinyl box. I just thought I'd buy the CD box as well. Extravagant, I know. But this, I listened to an awful lot during this review period. Also, keeping it in the 70s, essentially, television's Marky Moon, an absolute classic. Now, what I found listening to this was that the RME gave us a nicely clean, but not overly polished window on the music. But where it was really, really good was with a sense of rhythm and a sense of music's propulsion. And I think that's because this DAC is very good at exposing low level micro dynamics. And I guess overall, I was, or audio files like to say, I was immediately struck by blah, blah, blah. No, I wasn't immediately struck by this. It took about three weeks for me to really con conclude, well, halfway conclude that everything just sounded so right, top to bottom. It just sounded right. I don't have another way of explaining this. It just, yeah, it just sounded very convincing and just so satisfying. But on tonal color, it was a little bit cool, sort of towards that sort of bluey cool, a bit like this Sigma lens. So very detailed actually, this is a nicely detailed DAC, but not hyper detailed, not overly so. Yeah, cool, but detailed. Two more albums that I've been hammering lately. Daniel Avery's Song for Alpha. This is pure electronic music, at least 50% techno with some kind of like noisy distortions throughout. Terrific, terrific album. In stark contrast, Robin Hitchcock's Groovy Decay, or is this Groovy Decoy? Groovy Decay, because he re-recorded this 
or put out a different version with a different title, slightly different title. Anyway, this is from the 80s. This is kind of like alternative pop music, really. It's a bit of a murky sounding record, but, you know, still enjoyable. Still the kind of stuff I listen to. Anyway, I wanted to compare the RME DAC to something in a similar price point. And I kind of set myself up for this because a couple of years ago, I said the Chord Cutis was the DAC to beat at roughly 2K US dollars. In Germany, the Chord Cutis sells for 1,500 euros or thereabouts. The RME is 950 euros or 990 euros. So it's two thirds of the Chord's price, but because I said that the Chord was the DAC to beat, that was the one I pulled out of the cupboard for this comparison. Now the Cutis gives us similar levels of detail retrieval to the RME, but it sort of backs off the leading edge of transients. And that is especially noticeable in the top end where it's just a bit softer, a bit fuzzier, comparatively speaking. So with player outlines, the RME is crisper. It's just more clearly defined with sort of sounds and the way they kind of come and go. And this contrasts the chord as a sort of slightly more romantic sounding DAC, which I would never have said hearing the cutest, you know, on its own, never. And no, none of the optional filters on the cutest would give me the air bite, the RME's air bite with the Daniel Avery record. What puts the brakes on me saying that the RME is the better DAC than the Cutest are two very important factors. So number one, the Cutest is better with sub bass exposure. It pulls more from the depths. And I know this from listening to it and the RME through a headphone system. We'll get to that in a bit. The other thing that I think the Cutest is much better at than the RME is soundstage depth. It's more like a full frame DSLR or mirrorless camera where we can open the aperture so we get a good sense of front to back depth, usually with a blurry background. And because it's a little bit softer in the top end and therefore communicates a slightly stronger sense of warmth, that makes the cutest closer to the Canon lens. It's a little bit softer, it's just a shade warmer and not really with these two lenses, but it is better for people who really kind of crave the seduction of that illusory sense of depth between the loudspeakers. So we're talking about loudspeaker listening here. And if I have to criticize the RME, what is it called, ADI 2FS? Um, if I have to criticize that in any way, it its sense of depth is not amazing. It's probably a little bit closer to your average smartphone camera than say a DSLR. It's a bit flat where everything sort of seems to exist more on the same plane. So with its crisper edges and cooler tonality, the RME communicates a better sense of what we think accuracy might be as a feeling. It's clean, but it's not squeegee clean, not like the MyTech Brooklyn Bridge or Brooklyn Plus DAX. It's detailed, but not over etched. Like, I remember some of the really early ESS Sabre implementations, I'm, I'm talking about 10 years ago, would sort of over etch, like almost into, like, into wood. I think this is how Srajana Six Moons described it, as like over etching into wood. So it's not like that at all. It's just nicely there. And the other thing that I really love about this RME is it just seems to be completely unflappable when you feed it very complicated music. It doesn't seem to kind of go to pieces. I mean, the chord doesn't either, but it's just, I guess it seems to be more obvious with the RME. I guess audiophiles call this like a, a sense of composure during complex passages. So yeah, that's what I get from the RME ADI2FS. I know I've said it before, but like, who names these things? This is just, yeah, bonkers. I love, I love the chord naming scheme, so I guess that's where 
I kind of get off on this. I like just simple names that are calling a DAC Dave genius. <laughs> So, so far we've been talking about loudspeaker listening. I wanted to get a handle on how the RME 6.4 millimeter socket compares to like a, a dedicated headphone amplifier. So I pulled out the Rupert Neve RNHP from the cupboard and so used that as the headphone output. So fed the, out, the single ended outputs from the back of the DAC into the Rupert Neve and then compared its headphone output with the one on the RME. And what I liked about the Rupert Neve is it kind of just fleshed things out a little bit, just a little bit less sort of skeletal. Again, like the cutest, it just blurred the edges a little bit more, but not hugely so. And the Rupert Neve also added some base weight. Now, with the Meze Imperian, I found that very useful. With the Ross and Rad Zero headphones, less so. But it was good with the Meze's to give, you know, things like Marky Moon or this Thomas Fellman album I've been listening to called Hernig Pumper. It's like honey pump. It gave it just more, more push, just a little bit, but it didn't sound quite as clean and as crisp as the RME's own headphone output. Now in this particular situation, I preferred the Rupert Neve, just by a nose, but that's because I have it here and it's easy to set it up. If you don't have it, I actually don't think it's worth the extra money because the delta is so small between what comes out of the RME directly and then what comes out of the Rupert Neve with the DAC output going into the back of the Neve. And the reason I like the Rupert Neve a little bit more than the RME's own headphone output is it, it makes music sound a little bit prettier and a little bit less digital. And the other thing to consider here is if we're diverting the line out outputs of the RME into the Rupert Neve, we lose remote control ability from the listening position because obviously the Rupert Neve has no remote control. We have to stand up and turn the volume wheel. And also we don't get the benefit of the RME's crossfeed settings, which I think are just great. I mean, I guess that's because I'm a big fan of crossfeed. So this is done in DSP and what it does as far as I can tell is it kind of feeds a little bit of the right channel into the left and, the, and vice versa. So we get a slightly less wide and more forward focused head stage image. I like that, you, you might not value that as much, but I certainly do. And that's why I tend to prefer the RME as a standalone device from a functional standpoint and from a value standpoint. <laughs> A couple of words about gear matching here. Because of the way that the RME presents music in this sort of cooler, crisper kind of way, my favorite headphone with it wasn't the Meze Imperian or the Ross and Rad Zero, it was the Sennheiser Drop HD 6XX, which I think is the, the drop version of the 650. Because that Sennheiser has a lot of sort of thicker mid bass punch, it's not especially airy, so that crispness of the RME just counterbalances it just nicely. And it's the same with the NAD C316BEE V2 integrated amplifier, which I've mentioned in previous videos, that has that kind of thick, um, or thicker upper, yeah, upper base, and has lots of punch. So those kinds of Sounding ancillary devices seem to partner very well with the ADI-FS, ADI-2-FS, get it right. Now talk of RME's ADI-2-FS DAC slash headphone amplifier as being a giant killer has been mounting for some time. Well, at least in my world, in what I read online and people emailing me, at least five people have emailed me asking me to look at this DAC. So I bought one, 
I bought it from Tallman, and my plan was just to buy it from Tallman, make a video about it, and then send it back. But it didn't play out that way because, I, I mean, yeah, Olaf heard me yabber on about this about a month ago going, this thing's great, this thing's really cool, I don't want to send it back. I've got to compare it to the cutest, but I don't think it's going to be a clear win for the cutest, and it's not. That doesn't make the RME a giant killer, it just makes it a, a much closer sort of standoff than I really anticipated. And in terms of value for money, the RME walks all over the cord, as far as I'm concerned. But the RME sound quality isn't the only reason I've kept hold of this DAC. It's actually many of the little things that come from its internal DSP engine that I really, really dig. So first of all, as you can see right here, the 30 band spectrum analyzer and peak VU meters give us something to look at. I know that's useful for pros, but for me, it's like, yeah, there's something happening, or at the very least, I can t check that I've got a signal coming in. This unit also lets me set different volume levels for each of its three outputs, so independently, so I'm not you know, moving from headphones to not and getting myself blasted. And to that end, one thing I really like about this DAC is that it auto detects when an input's been engaged and then ramps up the volume over half a second to give you time to react in case something is wrong. That's really useful. And also inside this DAC is a loudness function. Now that's a bit like the sort of old school loudness button on your dad's integrated from the 70s, in that it was designed to kind of give a little bit more oomph and a little bit more spark on the top end when you're listening at low levels. This is based on the science of Fletcher, Fletcher? Fletcher Munson curves. So the lower the, the listening level, the less receptive or sensitive our ear becomes to bass and treble. So it allows us to kind of just knock it up a little bit at low volumes. Now this RME DAC has this loudness functionality, but it allows you to specify at which point on the volume dial you would like it to kick in at. I think that's really cool. And all of this comes from the power of DSP, which means purists are gonna be like, oh no, I'm not having DSP anywhere near my very precious DA conversion. Well, you're lost because there are so many cool things that you can do with this DAC above and beyond just decode music. So it's for pragmatists, pragmatists like me actually, I'm not an idealist. Pragmatists who want to tweak the EQ of the line output to better match the room, you know, with your loudspeakers. Or again, tweak the EQ curve according to whichever headphone that you have. I've got one friend who's got a pair of HD 800s. He finds them a little bit bright, like a lot of people do. He's got one of these DACs. And he said to me via WhatsApp, oh, I've just managed to make the HD 800s more agreeable by taking down the top end a little bit and giving them a little bit of nudge somewhere else, I think in the low end. Now you can't do that with a very many DACs at all, actually. And of course, you can also tweak the frequency response according to, wait for it, personal taste. Some people might just like a little bit more bass or a little bit less or a little bit of a mid-range boost. You can do it according to what you like and not what people try and tell you you should like, i.e. flat, because not everybody likes that. So that makes the RME ADI FS more of a movable feast than similarly priced rivals. I can't think of any other DAC at this price point that does so much on top of excellent DA conversion and excellent headphone amplification. I mean, I plugged my Campfire Audio Vega 2020s into here and just wow, it's just so much better than my phone. And my phone's not bad, it's an LG V40. It has a very decent DAC and headphone amplifier behind here, but this is just light years ahead of that. So in terms of value for money, I have never come across a DAC beneath the grand that offers so much for that 950 euros. This is just an absolute stellar bargain.
you like this video, please smash the like button down below. If you like my attitude to high-end audio in that, I love flexibility. I love functional flexibility. For me, that is almost as important as sound quality. I mean, if this DAC hadn't sounded as good as it did, I might not be so enthusiastic about it, but it does. It really is a great sounding piece. So yeah, if you like all of that, then subscribe to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. Just wait for the siren. We got the windows open today because of COVID, obviously. So if we use, for example, DAC A and DAC B and try and say to, well, <laughs> there's another one. But this DAC, I think, we're gonna, we're gonna do it in a moment. I think this DAC is heavier. Oh. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Man, I am making a mess of this, aren't I? <laughs> I, know. I would say that the, the, uh, oh. So with its crisper edges and its cooler tonality, we might say that the RME communicates what we feel like. Got the hands beak eyes and thing going again. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of feeds into, huh, with the pun, cross feeds into. But it isn't just the RME sound quality um, no, but it wasn't just the RME sound quality, no, <laughs> fucking hell, but the RME, s <laughs>